Coming up, we tackle the rod bearings and gently remove it. Flying bumper. We have special guests and some startling discovery. What? Even more damage and carnage. Aloha and welcome to part two of Project Riley. And we're starting with the big one, the rod bearings. Currently this V10 paired with a six pin manual is working absolutely fine. There are no codes and no woodpecker noises coming from this engine. But it does have 143,000 miles or 230,000 kilometers and I have no records of them ever being done. So before I do anything with this car, I want to swap them out and make sure the engine is healthy in that department. It is a rather big and complex job, so let the operation gentle touch commence. I'm going to tackle this job in stages. First, I'm going to remove everything from the top and front of the engine because I want to replace fuel injectors, Vanos high pressure line, water pump thermostat belt and a bunch of other stuff. Then we're going to move to the bottom, disconnect the suspension, drop the subframe and then we can access the oil pan. Vamonos! Ah, we have aftermarket air filters. Never been a big fan. Ouch. That wasn't very gentle. Perfect. Well, that's not disgusting. Another reinforcement bar. So I taped the bolts into their place, so that, that way I can't lose them. The expansion tank, I'm gonna be replacing that as well. Full of nice clean coolant. So I'm just going to pop the lower radiator hose because I'm going to be replacing all of the coolant hoses. Wiggle, wiggle. Excellent. Totally prepared for that. Now we can remove the expansion tank. Disconnect the sensor. Get an old glove, put it over the pipe, zip tight. Now we can attack the plenum, I believe. Remove the pipes on the side. So now there are a couple connections on the back of the plenum. You really need to have tiny hands for these. There's one and there's two. Another vacuum connection here. And there are two connections at the front, so I'm gonna remove this support here. Take that away, pack these in the back. Now we need to loosen band clamps on the throttle bodies. Jiggle, jiggle. Let's connect this line here. There we are. Look at those beautiful individual throttle bodies. So before we proceed, I want to cover the throttle bodies. Make sure nothing can get in there. Paper and some zip ties. Like that. With this long extension, it was super easy to do this. You don't have to do this, but I am a freak and I'm always scared I'm gonna drop something in there. Lovely, now I can get the fan out. Gonna remove this cover here. Whew. A lot of leaves. So I am probably going to remove the radiator as well. I'm not gonna replace it because it looks good, but there's just a lot of this crap that I want to blow out and clean because that can affect the cooling ability of this system. Connector, nice. Very good, take this stuff out of the way. Coolant hose removed. You don't have to, but it makes things a lot easier. So you can remove the fan without removing the coolant hoses. That makes it much easier. Nice engineering, I like that. Uh, this contraption is removed. Every single coolant line that I can reach and that I found on real OEM, I'm gonna replace. Might be an overkill, but I want this car to be as reliable as possible. Yeah. 
another coolant hose. That's pretty much all that I want to remove for now. Plenty of space in the front of the engine. Next step is to remove ignition coils, spark plugs, so it's easier to push the piston up. But for now, we can go underneath the car and start disconnecting suspension components. One of the big problems that I have now is the space. There just isn't any. Ooh, my donut. Gotta eat that. So what I'm going to do is start putting all of this crap inside the car. Because there's nothing else to do. A lot of you ask me why didn't I remove the hood on the E32 to make it easier to work. And where do I put it? You can't comfortably fart in here, let alone store parts. Now I'm going to remove the reinforcement plate and then drain the oil. So the oil filter is in front of the front right wheel and we're going to drain that now. Now we're going to put the car on the jack stands. Pop the wheel off. So the vehicle is placed on jack stands. And now we can start disconnecting suspension stuff. First, gonna remove the sway bar. And I'm replacing these. Oh yeah, those are... These are shot. Really shot. So way bar out. All right, now I'm gonna pop off the tie rods. By the way, I'm not going in any particular order. How's that looking? Well, not good. That is kaput as well. Good thing about everything new. See this one? Kaput as well. Time to remove ignition coils, spark plugs, close up the holes and then mount the engine support bar. Spark plugs out. Not terrible, not ideal, but not terrible. That's bank two done. Now I need to do bank one. Bank one is done as well. Now I can put the engine support bar. Don't need instructions. I am a man after all. Actually nine. We are first going to remove engine mount nuts, which are somewhere over there. So it's easier to drop the subframe. Ah, that clipped in. It's going to be very interesting to put back. There it is. And there's the second one. Now comes the engine support bar. Good. So for the second point, we are going to put bolt here. There's a threaded hole on the block. It takes M8 bolt and I bought one here. 10.9 grade. So that's firmly in place, strong bolt, two thick washers, and two chain links. That's not going anywhere. All right, now I can put a bit of tension on it because the engine top mounts are removed. So it can come up just a little bit and then we are safe to drop the subframe. You can see the engine moving. So put a bit of tension on it, not too much. So you can see the engine moving, that means it's a tiny bit in the air. We don't want to do too much because there's a lot of lines and stuff still attached to it. And you don't want to put stress on the transmission mounts. Good, we are done here. I can close the hood and go underneath. Now I'm going to unbolt the rest of the suspension, these control arms. So that's out. And 
There we are. So this one needs replacing, but we're gonna swing it to the side for now. First, disconnect the little sensor. And then rinse and repeat on the other side as well. And that's suspension disconnected. Next is removing the steering column from the steering rack. And there's an E-Torx E10 bolt. There it is. All right, so push it all the way up to pass the heat shield. So now I'm gonna bolt this power steering line here. And there is a bracket that holds it to the steering rack a bit lower there. So I'm gonna try and get to that now. And now I can unbolt it here. And I think that should be enough to start lowering the subframe. And since I don't have a lot of room on the four post lift, I'm gonna remove the entire subframe from the car. The banjo bolt. There it is. Now it's disconnected from the racket. And I think it'll be easier if I then disconnect that power steering line on the cooler there. Otherwise I have to disconnect it on the steering rack over there and that's gonna be really painful to put it back later because there's just no room to position the bolt nicely so I think if I remove it over there then this entire parsing line can come together with the subframe <laughs> so all in all that worked great because that is a quick disconnect that's thankfully not brittle so it was really easy to disconnect it and now this complete power steering line can come out with the subframe All right, that's it, one pump. Now I can start zipping out the subframe bolt. Where is the Milwaukee? Okay, leave it in. What? All right, so that's loose and the engine is supported and I can remove the subframe. All right, so that's all of the subframe bolts removed and I can gingerly lower it. One subframe out. Then I need to go and get some help and just kind of remove this entirely from the car. How heavy is this subframe? Oh. That's not heavy at all. I can just lift it on my own. I'm gonna hook this subframe out of the way. I think it's not heavy. It's all aluminium. Tie <laughs> rod. Oh yeah. Ladies and gents. Incredible hook. No, 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 don't bend it. There we are. That was easy. Actually less painful than I thought. A lot of space now. Next is to unbutton all of the stuff that's attached to the oil pan. So these are aux oil pump, auxiliary oil pumps. On the E39 M5, they call them scavenging pumps. It's for the cornering and G-forces. So you can always have sufficient oil pressure. Okay, good. Unplug the oil level sensor. Nice, and now we can remove the auxiliary pump. No. Ah, perfect pentazine on my face. There is a gasket here that needs to be replaced later. So now I can start unclipping the rest of the loom. Good. So now the accumulator. The use of zip ties in this operation is crucial. I think I'm gonna remove this bracket here now. So that's the accumulator removed. So now I'm gonna go around the perimeter of the oil pan and spray brake cleaner, just to make sure it's clean all around and nothing can end up in the engine or the oil pan. That way I'm safe. So first I'm gonna start with the E-Torx bolts on the transmission bell housing. Good, four Torx bolts for which you need a long extension. So 
So the extensions that I bought are actually not long enough for these two, so I had to thin this one out with a grinder real quick. Can you hear that? They're saying, Achtung, rote alarm. So about to go down. Okay, it says probe, so I'm sure that's nothing interesting. And now the last one. All right, slowly. Hello. So this is gonna, hopefully it doesn't smash on my foot. Good. Put that to the side. It looks really clean in here, if I'm being honest. Say hello to the bottom of the S85 engine. That is our Venus pump, oil pump. All of that is gonna come out. So we are actually going to pause here because I need to take this oil pan to the machine shop. BMW doesn't always get it right from the first time, so for the LCI model of the M5, they redesigned this oil pan. Well, they didn't redesign it, it's exactly the same one, but they added the second drain hole over there where that big puddle is. Because with this one right now, you can never drain that oil over there. So it always stays, I think, 0.6 or 0.7 liters in the pan that you can never drain when you do the oil change. I'm gonna go and take this oil pan to the CNC shop. They're gonna drill, weld in a bunk, and then I can put the second plug in there. Scheiße, Hans. Hans! Was, man? We made a mistake. A failure? No, we never. Yeah, we designed oil when we nearly one liter of oil says when we drain. Komisch. I take the warren rod bearing, put it in the pocket, and pretend rod bearing issue does not exist. Boop! Forgotten! What should we do about this? Schnell put the second hole here and no one will know, yeah? That's is smart. Aber morgen, off to the pub, beer tight. Grab the essentials. Yeah, genau, and when we come back, we design the kidney grills. Yeah! Where's he coming from? I see no issue here. And this is how I organized all pen bolts. I'm gonna be replacing all of these because they're a bit crusty and rusty, so I don't wanna reuse them. But basically I created a template from the new oil pan gasket and just stab oil pan bolts wherever they go. The oil pan is with the machine shop and we can proceed. Now I need to remove this oil cubing. Two bolts here, two here. There it is. So at this point I can remove the oil pump and vanus pump, but I am going to start with a couple of rod bearings just because I wanna see what their condition is. And if we have a problem with the crankshaft, then this here is not even important anymore. All right, boys and girls. I did two rods off camera so I can get a feel for it, be more comfortable and explain it better to you what we are doing. I did cylinder number four and nine, and this is what we have, originality. These are original rod bearings to this car. And I know that because of the numbers on the back of the shell, it says 088 slash 089. And these are early production rod bearings for these engines that were in use until 2007. After 2007, BMW redesigned rod bearings and used different materials that didn't contain lead, something to do with environment, blah, blah, blah. And I read somewhere that these, because they're made of softer material, are actually easier on the crank. But the crank, at least those two journals look mint. Nowhere at all, no scoring, it's smooth as glass. And I know these are original because the production date of this car is December 2006 and there is no way that someone replaced the rod bearings and then was able to get these because they are no longer made or sold. And when it comes to bearing itself, these are not terrible 
but they're not great either. You can see plenty of wear on the top and some on the bottom, but considering that this car has 143,000 miles, this is not bad at all for original rod bearings. When it comes to new rod bearings, there are so many choices out there and I'm not gonna stand here and tell you which one is the best. Just do your own research and go with whatever makes you comfortable. My research brought me to BE bearings and BE ARP 2000 rod bolts. BE bearings have been on the market for a very long time. They were specifically designed to provide extra oil clearance for the S65 and S85 engine. They're made by Clevite, which is OEM manufactured for BMW, so the quality is there. And each bearing is hand measured by BE bearings to achieve perfect oil clearance for this crank. These are the top bearings, these are the lower bearings. When it comes to rod bolts, I really didn't want to use original rod bolts because the torquing procedure for these is ridiculous. You have to torque it to whatever new meters, then degrees, then again degrees, and you have to do that three times for each bolt in order to stretch it properly. And there's so much room for error over there that I didn't wanna mess around with it at all. These you just torque to 50 foot-pounds and you're done. First, I'm slowly rotating the crank until I can access two rod caps and make sure the socket with extension fits. These are fracture split connecting rods. They are forged from a single piece and then the cap is snapped from the rod. This results in an even fracture surface on the rod and the cap making for perfect fitment and strength. Each rod and rod cap are unique and cannot be mixed or turned around, dropped or damaged in any way. It has to go back together exactly how it was removed and both parts are stamped with numbers on the side indicating which way they are to be installed. Additionally, I'm drawing a line with a marker to make it more visible. I'm using a breaker bar and this is 12.12mm socket. The other one. And now we can continue by hand. Once the bolts are removed, the cap typically stays on the crank and you have to tap it with a rubber mallet to break it loose. But always hold the cap with one hand when removing the bolts as we cannot risk dropping it. Remove them easily. There's one and I'll hold the cap. That doesn't matter. So see the cap stayed inside. Take a rubber mullet. That's all it needs. And gently remove it. Take it to the table. That is the rod cap removed. It says 957. So this here is a clean working environment. I scrub down the desk to make sure there's no crap or debris on top of it. See how it says 957? The rod has the same markings on the side of it. So that's how you know that these line up. I also put a small marker, so just makes it easier and more noticeable. But this is the rod cap, rod bearing. And this is how the bearing looks like. I always like to handle these caps on the desk, never in the air because like I said, I can be clumsy and I really cannot run the risk of dropping these. So to remove this shell or bearing, you push it here like that and it comes out. So that's rather easy to do on the cap. The tricky bit is doing this in the rod in the engine above the crank. So what I did is practice a couple of times putting this in, pushing it back and see how it's easier and to get the better feel for it. So I can do it in the engine because basically you have to do it blind. You cannot see anything above. We need to push the rod or the piston all the way up above the crank and hold my fingers on the edges here so you, and make sure it doesn't hit or lean or do anything to the crank because this is very sharp and it can easily damage or score the crank and you really don't want that. So the way that I'm doing, I'm using both of my hands and fingers and make sure I cover this with my fingers and push it all the way up. And once I see and feel that it's above the crank, then I can let it swing and hit the block over there. Well, not the head, but just lean it next to the block. Clean gloves, start pushing. There we go. I've oil in my hair. Stop dripping on me. You can see how the rod is above the crank now and you can see the bearing in. So you just have to make sure that that part of the rod is above the crank and not touching it in any way and then you need to do the same thing push the bearing to the side and remove it steady hand concentration is the key here clean hands again well there it is <laughs> there it is slowly slowly out it comes and there you can see it rod without a bearing and the crank looks perfect i'm gonna clean it up right now and run my finger through it just to make sure there's 
that I can't feel anything under the finger. That's the key here. If you can feel any scratches or scoring or whatever, it's time to panic, go home, scream into a pillow, then come back and hope it can be polished out. But so far, this is looking good. And this bearing looks about the same as the others. So the top ones are always gonna have the most wear. But now I have a very, very clean microfiber towel. And I'm just gonna clean a little bit so I can feel the crank with my finger. Yeah, looks perfect. No edge, smooth as glass. Excellent. Get in there and trying to clean the rod for the new cap to go in. So I did use plastic gauge when I did the first rod bearing, but here's the thing that you need to know about plastic gauge. It's not accurate. It's only gonna give you a ballpark. The nominal clearance for these bearings is 0.00235 or something. I forgot, I can put it on the screen. And the plastic gauge only shows you 0.002 or 0.003. So there's no way you can tell what it is accurately. And the one that I measured here showed around 0.002 and that's pretty much the ballpark that you can get and that you can be happy with the plastic gauge. That being said, I don't think it brings that much value here because the crank looks good and the bearings are hand measured for perfect clearance. If I was using something else that I wasn't really sure about, then it makes sense to use the plastic gauge. But since these bearings are hand measured individually, I'm not gonna do plastic gauge again. To clean the seating position for the bearing, I just use a little bit of brake cleaner to make sure all contaminants are removed. For a jagged edge, just a little bit brake cleaner to make sure it's clean. So absolutely spotless gloves for this and take your lower bearing, give it a bit of, make sure there's no dust. And all bearings, they have a little notch here and you need to line this up with this groove here on the cap. And the way you do that is you first put that there, like so, and the barrack is gonna sit like this. Then you hold with your thumb here and you press down on this one until it's fully seated. And that's it. Then you just make sure that this is as level as possible. It won't be 100% because this isn't flat, it's rigid. Basically you want it to look like this, nice and flat. And that's it, that's how you install the bearing. This is really easy to do on the cap, but the really tricky bit is doing this on the rod. And I'm using one microfiber towel for one rod, and then I'm throwing it away and using a new one. Take the top bearing. And it's going in. Good news! Perfectly in. And also when you're lowering down the rod, make sure the edge does not touch anything else. You just wanna lower it down cleanly onto the crank without touching anything else. You can see that the bearing is perfectly seated, flat on both sides and notch lined up. So it's ready for assembly lube and then we can pull it down. So now we're going to prepare the bolts. So a little bit of lube on the head of the bolt here. And also on the thread of the bolts. Nothing in the middle. And that's it. And now I'm gonna put this within hand reach when I put the rod cap in. Discard the gloves because you do not want this loop to end up on a bearing. And I'm using lint-free paper. And BMW Repair Manual says to coat the bearing in thin layer of oil. But because I'm going to be rotating this crank a few times, I'm going to use assembly lube, this stuff. And I'm just going to put a light coat on it, on the cap, and also on the top bearing as well. So you don't have to lose a ton, just coat the bearing. This stuff is very sticky and it's going to wash out when the oil hits it. So the top bearing is lubed up as well, and now it's a really tricky bit of lowering or pulling this rod down and sitting it on the crank properly without bumping into anything. The easiest way I found so far, because I can't put both of my hands in there, is to use old rod bolt. And that way I have more control and force to pull it slowly and precisely. 
put your middle finger there and it's coming down. Perfect. Remove the bolt. You don't have to use this if you can get your hands in there. It's probably even easier, but I really cannot. Make sure it's seated all the way. So put your fingers in there and pull it some more. And yep, that's perfect. So the rod is in its place and you just want to make sure that the bearing is still perf perfectly seated. And I can see that it is on both sides. It doesn't have to be exact to one millimeter because like I said, this surface here is not flat, so you cannot get it 100% perfect all around but really close enough. And once I place in the cap, I have to hold it with my finger with perfect pressure and start doing the bolts. I cannot move it. I have to be 100% sure that these rigid edges are lined up. So like that, make sure it's perfectly seated. Hold it, start the bolts. This is a good exercise for your hands. Still hold pressure, get the socket and snug them up. Like that. Switch hands. There you go. So, oil right into my mouth. It's just, I'm getting oil everywhere. My mouth, hair, down my neck. The next task is torquing the rod bolts and I have a really nice hazard torque wrench. This was a gift from a very nice subscriber. Thank you, Philip. And the torque for these rod bolts is 50 foot pounds, but this one is in Newton meters and that comes to about 68 Newton meters, which is 50.15 foot pounds. So that's pretty good, pretty close. And we want to do slowly one side, then the other side. And then when you feel like it's coming to the proper torque, then you do one fluid motion until it clicks and you stop. You do not go more, you do not click twice, you move to the next one and do the same thing. So that's how we're gonna do it. And you also want to use as less extensions as possible because they absorb torque. These are 11 millimeter 12 socket. The OEM bolts are 12 millimeter 12 socket. So. Stop. Stop. Done. And now you can see how the fracture is basically invisible. That's how you do rod bearings. It might seem easy, but it really isn't. The fact that you have no room to make mistakes. If you make a mistake, done. You can say goodbye to the engine. So that's why it's really tricky. And that's why I really don't recommend anyone doing this if you're not confident you can do it, right? Take it to someone who can do it properly because so many of these engines actually blew up because of improper installation. And that's it. And you can see how it's perfectly seated and torqued. Now we're gonna move to this fella, cylinder number two. Take a mallet, oh, no need. I can actually see into the cylinder walls as well and they look brand spanking new. Push up this above the crank all the way up. Ah, there it is. That's the bearing out. Pretty much the same wear as the rest of them. This is the top one, obviously. Push the bearing sideways. Perfectly in. Now I can put assembly lube and lower the rod. So that goes in like that. Ah, 
done. That is eight rods done. Now we only have cylinder one and five. And for that, I'm gonna remove the oil pump and vinyl pump because that needs to come out anyway. Remove this. Now I need to remove this nut. <laughs> Slippery. So now I need to push up on the tensioner and hold it with my thumb or finger and then slide the gear out, which is just really tricky because I have no space here. Is. Take the gear out so it doesn't drop. So I guess now I can remove the old pump. There's the pump. With the pump out of the way, now we have easy access to the two remaining rods on cylinder one and six. There it is. All right. So this plastic tool really helps to nudge the upper bearing and then you can remove it. Once you get a hang of it, it's really easy to put the upper shell in. You just first always line up the notch and then you just push it in with the other finger on the other side. You can just see how mint the crank is, the journals that is. Nowhere, no lines, spotless. This is the journal on cylinder number six, the last rod that we're doing and the crankshaft is thankfully in excellent condition. So this is a really, really healthy engine. And that is the last rod bearing done, thankfully. Now I can breathe easier knowing that the crankshaft is in excellent condition and it has new bearings to chew on. Here's a little sit trap. Everything went swimmingly, really did. I paid extra attention to make sure all of the bearings are properly seated because that's extremely important. If they're not, then you're running a risk of spinning the bearing and then your engine is gonna go boom, boom. And I also paid extra attention not to touch uh, rigid edges anywhere near the crank or anything remotely hard. So all of that is done properly, torque to spec, and as you can see, I marked all of the bolts. So I'm really happy how that operation went there. And here are the rod bearings, all 10 of them, and they actually don't look too bad. I mean, there's plenty of wear on them, but for this particular engine, and considering it has 143,000 miles, this is really not too bad. And if you look all of them, they're not down to copper. You can ever so slightly see it on cylinder five and three, but the crank is in mint condition. The issue with these bearings is that no one can tell you how long these have been like this. There's no way to know unless you remove them. This could have happened in the last 10,000 kilometers, or it could have been like this for the last 100,000 kilometers. You just can't know. Nonetheless, I'm really happy that I did this because there's some obvious wear on all of them, and now it has new bearings to chew on, and the crankshaft is in perfect order. So I'm really happy with this engine. And I'm actually extremely surprised how clean this engine is because I've seen some people opening these engines and there's just war varnish and sludge everywhere, but there's just no buildup on the walls anywhere. It's kind of difficult to show with camera, but you can actually see that the cylinder walls are in mint condition. There's no wear on them at all. There's no way I can show you that on camera, but the cylinder walls look just mint. Also, I was obsessed with having clean hands and gloves whenever touching the engine or its components. So I consumed about 16 million towels and two million pairs of gloves. But it is really key that you keep the engine as clean as possible. So I'm getting ready to drop the Vanos pump and I just wanted to see what the factory gear lash is on this Vanos pump before I remove it. So I have my dial set up and it's zeroed out now. And when I pull it, it's six millimeter. Repair manual states six to eight millimeters. So six is right on the money. Now that we know how that looks like, we can proceed and remove the Vanos pump. There it is. Put the pump and then I can grab the tensioner here. So this is the Vanos high pressure pump. This contraption, three bolts that hold it. And this is the tensioner piston spring and then this is the pocket on which the spring sits and you can see vanos high pressure line there and there's also a small vanos filter here that we're going to replace 
but now we're gonna go up top and pull this line out. And this is the Vanos high pressure line. This one here, this is the T fitting that goes, this is the external Vanos line here, it goes up top and then all the way down to accumulator. I'm gonna be replacing that one as well. It's the banjo bolt. Oh my god. That was the power steam line. Because I'm replacing that crap too. It's just easier to remove it now. That's the external Vanos line. I disassembled most of the car at this point. Whoa. Out it comes. There we are. That is the famous Vanos high pressure line. And it likes to leak over here over time and cause all sorts of problems with the Vanos system. Here is the new high pressure Vanos line and the O-ring doesn't come with it. You have to buy it separately. It goes on top here, clean the hole. New Vanos line going in. The O-ring is also generously lubed up. Oh yes. And it's through. Good, so I can push it all the way in. That's in. There's our new line. And now we're going to change this little filter here in the block. The old mesh filter is pulled out and the new one gently tapped into place. So now we're going to take apart the heart of the car, the main oil pump. Considering how many miles this car has, it is just smart to take this apart and see if there's anywhere on it. While I'm already in here, I just want to have a peace of mind that this is a good working pump. Based on how the engine looks, how everything is clean, I'm 99% sure that this is going to be perfect. Oh, there we are. So I guess now we're looking for scoring marks here. This looks perfect. Oh yeah, this pump is shot. Definitely shot. Strong scoring on this thing. There goes another 800, 900 euro. Heavy scoring here. That is a deep scratch. There as well. You can feel it on the fingernail. And this should be perfectly smooth. Unfortunately, we're gonna need a new oil pump. But on the other hand, I am really glad that I took my time and opened this pump. Because if I put it back in the car, this would kill the engine sooner or later probably with low oil pressure or something. So at this point, I know this is bad and well, I can hit it with a hammer and see how I can open this further. And you know what's funny? Just this morning before I came to the garage, I stopped by the dealer and I spent 1,043 euros on the lines and a lot more parts. And now I have to go back and spend another 900. So we are up to, I wanna say 5,000 in parts. Brilliant. Now, did I say it's, I'm 99% sure it's gonna be fine? Yeah, I'm gonna eat my own words now. There it is. Ooh, some heavy scoring here as well. Imagine if I did all this work and then I put this pump back into the car. And then it goes boom, boom after some time. Yep, there's scoring here on this surface as well. Whoa, even more damage and carnage. This here can actually cut my glove onto this. It is that bad. Yeah, yeah. And look at the bottom of it. I could barely pull it out because it was scratching when I was pulling it out. And this needs to be all smooth and perfect. I just pulled another one and it looks even worse. The pump is kaput and we're going to put it on the side and I'm gonna order a new one and move on to inspecting the Vanos pump. Now we're gonna take apart the Vanos pump. And this is the big one, boys. If this one is bad, I'm out. Well, two and a half thousand euros. Hello. What? The ring is snapped. Good golly. Luckily, I have a rebuild kit from Mr. Vanos. No, Dr. Vanos. That has a brand new ring in it. But it snapped. Look at that. 
that is the crack in the bearing ring. Lovely crack there. We have failed oil pump and our failed vanos pump. This combination is really deadly for this engine. This day just keeps getting better. Nope. There we are. Ah, oh, it's out. Ooh, there's actually a big chunk missing there. So maybe that's what destroyed the oil pump. Piece from here ended up in the oil pump, smashed and scored everything. I went back and forth on this pump, but I ended up not using it. These little plungers glide on the bearing race, and as there was a crack in it, the tips got damaged going over it, and this was the source of tiny metal shavings that I found in the oil filter cap when I did the oil change a while back. Luckily, a nice fan of the channel hooked me up with a nice price for a good use, the low mileage Vanos pump, which I also took apart, and it was in perfect condition inside. I put new chain and chain guides on it, and it was ready to go onto the engine. Man, we avoided a really big bullet there. If this pump went kaboom, and it would have, if I left the ring like that, and if I didn't inspect this, combined with the old pump, this engine wouldn't last that much. And we would destroy it perfectly healthy engine. As you would imagine, BMW made another improvement for LCI models or engines after 2007. And that is redesigned piston oil squirters. These things. The one on the right is the old style that I just removed from the car. And this is the new one. A new one supposedly offers better piston cooling and whatnot. And I'm not entirely sure how accurate that is because the engine is still working fine with these old ones. I mean, the cylinders are brand new. So maybe this is some sort of improvement if you're really pushing the car hard. But since I'm already in here again, I'm just going to replace them. They are not terribly expensive. There's five of them and they were around 150 euro, I want to say. To replace them, it's also not that difficult. They live, well, as you would imagine, on the block, above the rods and they squirt oil into the cylinders. To put new one in, I use this long extension with new bolts, bit of blue thread locker, cause you wanna make sure this doesn't fall out. And there is no torque for these bolts, so you just go finger tight and leave it there. You do not wanna snap one of these bolts. There's the bolt. And now we can rotate the crank. Now I can get to the second one. All right, second bolt. And I'll grab clean, long needle nose pliers and take it out. Slowly, there we are. Bit of blue thread locker and this is how it goes in. Now this is a bit tricky because like I said, this one is wider than the old one. Get it in and you have to make sure you don't bend or damage this. Rotisserie chicken. Started the bolt. That is one bolt started. And now I need to use a socket and Allen extension and kind of position the squirter into place and then do that bolt all the way in. All right, so that bolt is holding the squirter nice and firmly. That's it. The piston squirter or sprayer in there it is in place here are all of the old piston squirters and bolts so since i have nothing else better to do while waiting on the new oil pump i'm gonna clean up this subframe and replace the engine mounts Ooh! there we are nothing too crazy just a little bit cleaner and this engine mount seems good but this one is all sorts of wobbly. Kaput! Inverted Torx E10. It's very light. Hello! New OEM engine mounts, lamp order. Bolts with just a dab of blue thread locker. Done. This is my current obstacle. I cannot open the garage door. Oh, my fingers. Ah, nearly. 
Ah, oh, I can't feel my fingers. <clears throat> there we go. How did I? Oh, nope. Very cold. Oh, I need two hands. Oh, finally. 16 years later, the new pump is here. Oh yeah, excellent. First, I'm going to install a new chain tensioner. These three guys, springs, piston, and spring pocket. Well, that's staying. Oh, that stays in. Stay. So, bolt. I think that's sufficient for now. Now I'm going to thread in banjo bolt. So we'll torque it to spec a little bit later. Good, now we are ready for the oil pump. Production date, 18-11-2020. So I think before we put it in the car, I'm just gonna put some oil down its throat. Give it some. You're ready to put that on the car. Okay, so now the clean gear can go back as such. Perfect. That went all the way in. And then you can feel the tensioner. Yep. New oil pump nut with green high strength thread locker. And now a dab of thread locker. Now the new nut, which also comes with thread locker on it. That's it, donezo. So I think now I'm gonna torque this banjo bolt and then we're gonna start setting the gear lash. So this is the tool that I'm using to measure Vanos gear backlash, magnetic stand and small dial gauge. Move the gear, you can see it's four millimeters now and we need to set it between six and eight. So I think it's better to set it on the high side because as you torque the bolts for the Vanos pump, it's gonna change the gear lash again. So if we can get it around seven in the middle, that'll be perfect. The Vanos gear backlash is set with pump bolts lightly snugged up and then tap on the pump to move it from side to side and change the backlash. This was by far the most annoying bit for me. I'd set it to one value and once I rotate the crank and remeasure, I'd get a totally different reading. I spent a lot of time dialing it in and in the end I got it to where it's between 0.06 and 0.08 with one full rotation of the gear and remeasuring at different places. 0, 7, 0, 7. Another thing that I did between rotating the engine is spray fogging oil into the cylinders because we don't have any oil in the engine and I want pistons to be lubricated when they go up and down and I'm rotating the crank. I also spray it on the chain and whatnot so that stuff is really great and especially now because it's been sitting for a couple of days. The oil pan is back and Robert, guy who did this, did an excellent job. So you have to position the drain hole a little bit on the side. You cannot put it in the middle because that's where the oil pickup tube comes. And this is exactly how BMW did it as well. So he drilled a side of the pan, put in the bunk and then welded it nicely in. And now we can take OEM drain plug. And here's how it looks on the inside. Like I said, oil pickup tube comes right in the middle. That's why this goes a bit on the side and he could not weld around here because that would create excessive material and perhaps some fitment issues. So that's going to stay like that. But when it comes to the strength, this is just perfect and it's done properly. You cannot simply drill and tap in threads. That's not going to be as good or last. So this is the proper way to do it. So this is thoroughly cleaned. The way I went about it is I used fresh petrol, sloshed it around a couple of times drained it then i used clean carbon fiber towels vacuum cleaner compressed air 
and finally fresh oil that I just slushed all over the place and this is as clean as it's going to get. So I'm going to use zip ties to make sure the gasket doesn't move when I install it. Zip ties removed. Okay, so all of the oil pan bolts are snugged up and now I'm gonna do the final torque. Then all accessories around the engine are reinstalled with new gaskets along with a new power steering line and external vanos line. Look, this is why I wanted to remove it in the first place, to clean it. All of that needs to be vacuumed and cleaned. I'm gonna replace the water pump now because I have all this space here. So this water pump setup is similar to E46 M54 engine. You have two threaded holes on the side where you can put in the bolt, slowly thread it in and push out the water pump, but I'm just gonna pull on it. Not coolant. So admittedly there's nothing wrong with this water pump, but I just wanna replace it as part of preventative maintenance. Here is new Bomba de Agua. There it is. Time to do the thermostat. Four bolts. And I think I'm going to have to remove some of the stuff here so I can lift it up. A long bolt. There we are. Take out the old thermostat. That is nice and in. Now I'm going to replace the O-rings. Perfect. There we are. Right, and with that, we are ready for the subframe. Time to pretend I'm Hulk again. Yep. My name is Gino da Campo. And this is my Italian desert. Brilliant. There it is. The bolt goes back with a bit of thread locker on it. Now I can remove the support bar. New spark plugs and ignition coils. First spark plug going in. Done. Now we're going to replace the oil cooler, which means removal of the bumper and headlights. Bumper needs to come out anyway because it's broken and I have a different one. But the reason I'm replacing the oil cooler is because we evidently had some metal in the oil from that broken bearing race on the Venus pump. And when I did an oil change on this car, when I bought it, it had about 10,000 miles on the old oil. And when I removed the filter, at the very bottom of the oil filter cap, I found some metal. At that time, I thought it was probably bearings. But now I'm almost certain that it came from that broken race because a big chunk of metal was missing and that got smashed all over the engine. The good news is when I did that oil change, I didn't find any metal in the oil whatsoever, only at the bottom of the oil filter cap. But based on that, I want to replace the oil cooler because it's extremely difficult to flush it and they're known for leaking. New one is not that expensive and since I'm doing all of this, might as well replace that and make sure that the oil is clean everywhere. What was that? There you go. And that's the bumper removed. Where do I put it? Here is the oil cooler. It's from 2012, so it was definitely replaced at one point. Two lines here, couple of bolts, and it comes out. There you go. Here is the new one, OEM Bear.
new o-rings lube up the o-rings new radiator goes in and i actually filled it up with oil probably don't need to but it just makes sense oops there we are done this is the replacement bumper that i sourced a while back it's the same color and by that i mean it's not the same color but close enough not really it goes well with the 58 shades of gray theme that this car has going on for itself what with the mismatched doors and whatnot and uh, it's not broken and that's all i need for now we can pass tooth inspection like that and then once the car is mostly mechanically sorted then we'll paint this bumper and two doors on the left side and hopefully then it'll look less colorful also i broke my nail when i was removing pdc sensors so that's good This is by far the stupidest design to install and remove headlights. <laughs> there we are, like brand new. This isn't. Now we're going to add oil to the engine, starting with the filter. And I always like to pre-lube the oil filter. Put it in. As part of preventative maintenance, I'm also going to replace fuel injectors, 230,000 kilometers, it's time to refresh them. And I've seen a case when one of these goes bad, it actually becomes stuck open, washes out the cylinder, or locks up the engine. That sounds really scary and I don't want that to happen, so I'm just going to replace them as part of preventative maintenance. There they are. Verify that the new ones look the same. They do. Those are our old injectors. Oh, perfect. Oh, I hit myself in the chin. Perfect. New injectors, OEM Bosch. Not that you have any other choice. All right, so I've used a little bit of Vaseline on the O-ring so they slide in easier because you do not want to tear these. Then we're gonna have a leak. Slides in like butter. There you go. Now we can gingerly put them in. Alrighty, we are ready to crank over the engine. I disconnected the fuel pump, fuse 30 in the glove box, 72 in the trunk, ignition coils, fuel injectors, all of that is disconnected, accessory belts as well. And I'm just gonna crank over a couple of times, build up the oil pressure, get the oil moving in the engine. Then I'm gonna reconnect all of this stuff and we're actually gonna fire it off without the plenums or accessory belts, just so I can hear the engine. If it sounds good, then we can proceed and assemble everything else. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, I'm quite nervous. Everything is reconnected and we are ready for the first start. I'm not gonna run it for long, just a couple of minutes, see how it sounds because the car is gonna freak out since nothing is connected. Sing! It's alive again. Sounds nice. So before I start putting everything back together, I'm also going to replace Power Sting Reservoir and the two lines. They're leaking, so might as well. Might as well. This is the Power Sting Reservoir. It has a filter inside, so it's really smart to change it occasionally. And the two lines that are leaking pretty badly. It connects there, and that is a quick disconnect, which means it won't be. So let's just start. That went well. There is a special place in hell for whoever invented stupid quick disconnect power steering lines. <sighs> every time, every time I waste time trying to unbolt stupid power steering line that's going to break, then I have to buy it and of course it costs million euros and you have to wait three months to get it. Three days later, finally removed. Oh, it's just, I'm slipping constantly. Come on, you stupid hose. I have no patience for this. 
There it is. I mean, what design is this? What is this? That is the beauty of it. You cannot remove it. So I can't swing it down because obviously that's gonna hit there. So how do we remove this? Maybe I need to disassemble the entire car now. Perfect. See, this looked easy. It's not easy. Well, isn't that marvelous? I mean, the design is just biblical. Never seen anything like it. That took an insane amount of work to remove. I don't know who, how, and what engineered this, but it's just ridiculous. New power steering lines and the reservoir. I'm just waiting for the compressor line to blow in my face and basically take my face away, which is why I'm wearing eye protection. It's <sighs> 10 seconds and it went in and it took me 40 minutes to remove it. <sighs> Woosa. Stupid thing. Reconnect the stupid lines. All right, we lost. Well, I was about to say one thing, but it's two things now. It's just, it's, it's time to go home. All connected. Now I'm just gonna cross my toes that it doesn't leak there because I'm really not in the mood to replace another power steering line. This motorized vehicle is using hydraulic fluid for power steering, which is CHF 11, pentenzine, or the green hydraulic fluid. Liquid Moly also makes it, so we're gonna use that. Now we're going to do pulleys, shot, and then here, shot. And this one is particularly making interesting noise. Interesting, isn't it? Belts, of course. New belts and pulleys installed. I bought every single plastic coolant line including the expansion tank and sensors, and now we're gonna install that. Clean radiator going in, and by the way, these two valves are to drain coolant without making a mess. You attach a hose here, undo the valve, and drain the coolant. Easy as that. A uh, plastic cover that was missing. We're also going with brand new MAFs. This car came with aftermarket air filters, and here's what I think about them. OEM. Perfecto. So let's get it going again. We are bleeding the vanos right now. That's gonna take about 16 minutes. And this is how it sounds, fully warmed up. Purrs like an agricultural machine. Still got it. I'd call this a job well done. It still sounds like a diesel, exactly the same like before, but I'm told that these pre-LCI models or pre-facelift models have different Vanos gears, so they just rattle in general. So that was my first impression on the first day I heard this engine. I said it sounded like an agricultural machine, and it does. The good thing after 3000 RPM, it sounds like a race car. If you thought we are done throwing money at this thing, we are not. Time to do the front suspension. Gonna start with the tie rod. Now this is a ginormous nut. I believe 37, 38 mil. 
and I don't have a wrench that big, so I'm gonna use channel locks. There we are. And that's that. Now I need to make sure that the new tie rod is the same length as the old one, otherwise the car is gonna track really badly. It's gonna get alignment nonetheless, but we just need to get it as close as possible so you can drive to the alignment shop. That's as close as it's going to get. Now we need to tighten it. Make sure it bottoms out and that's it. There it is. Uh, that one. Need a special tool for this. Nice and firm. Pop the ball joint in. Like that. Brand new nut. And that's the tie rod done. And we'll do the final torque later. Now onto the control arms. Finally, there it is. <clears throat> and now the thrust arm. And now we need to lower the steering knuckle because the strut is in the way and the ball joint cannot come out. First, I'm gonna clean and mark its position. So gotta remove the pinch bolt. So there's a proper BMW tool to spare the steering knuckle. And I don't have that, of course, so I'm gonna use a chisel. So I just use the chisel to keep the spindle open and now I can smack it from above and hopefully lower it. There it is. Now we need to raise up the spindle. New bolt and nut. The ball joints are whopping 165 newton meters. Brand new bushings for the sway bar. I also left sway bar bushing brackets loose. I'm gonna torque them with the car on the ground. And we are finally at the point where I can put the wheels and get the car off the jack stands. The wheels are back on and it's time to drive it back and forth and then torque the bushings. That is if it still drives. Hey, it drives. So I have an issue with the power steering pump. I just cannot bleed the damn thing. So something is wrong with the power steering pump. It's perfect. So the torque for control arm bushings is 100 Newton meters. It is finally put back together. Everything is reassembled. I just need to buy engine cover and transmission cover. And those are stupid expensive and used, they all ruined. And here's what was spent on parts so far on this wallet-friendly vehicle. <laughs> yeah, nah. I could've skimped on a lot of stuff, but preventative maintenance and OEM parts are going to be the key with this car. If I were a peacock, I'd be spreading my feathers right about now. You know, I was in high school back when Clarkson reviewed one of these, didn't know what a spark plug was back then, and here I am now fixing one. Life's funny. I gotta say, this was a lot of fun. Expensive, but a lot of fun. I learned a lot about this engine during its open-heart surgery and what makes it thick.
literally. It was really important to know that the engine is healthy before I put more money into it, and that it is. Super clean inside, and I did the best I could to prolong its life. In the future episodes, we'll continue preparing it for German tooth inspection, get the rest of it mechanically sorted, and install LCI headlights and taillights. Boy, that's gonna be expensive. Anyway, do me a solid and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed the video. Also, should you want to support projects such as this one, check out my Patreon account and merchandise. The links are in the description. As always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Maybe it's time to finally wash it. The weather is certainly nicer. Yeah, we'll do that.